All right, while everybody's getting their seats, a couple of announcements just to remind everybody about registration for Chafer Seminary's fall term. Uh, that is going uh, very well right now. And if you're a member of West Houston Bible Church, you can take up to two courses uh, tuition free. And then the registration fee is waived if you register by Sunday. <clears throat> also, the course schedules are up on chafer.edu. The other thing is that um, the documentary that uh, on the essential church that is out there is still out there. It's still in some theater. So you go to theessentialschurch.com and you click on buy tickets and then it asks where your zip code is and then it'll tell you what theaters are, are, are nearby and you just go check on those or if you've got some kind of um, app on your phone you can just put in your look for your local local theaters now they're not haven't been in a lot of places but they were originally just going to be three nights and they keep adding and keep adding and so more people are are getting an opportunity to go to that so i encourage you to to look for those and go do that if indeed it's still showing in your neighbor uh, neighborhood and that is it for announcements how shall a young man cleanse his way by taking heed thereto according to thy word. Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. Jesus prayed to the Father, sanctify them in truth. Thy word is truth. For the grass withers and the flower fades, but the word of our God shall stand forever. Before we get started, we'll have a few moments of silent prayer just so we can uh, confess sin if necessary, which simply means to admit or acknowledge our sin to God, and instantly He forgives us and cleanses us from all righteousness. And this is to prepare us for the study of His Word this evening. So let's bow our heads together and go to the Lord in prayer. Our Father, it's such a great privilege we have to come together to focus upon you, focus upon your word, come to understand more about our Lord Jesus Christ in terms of his a person. And uh, Father, we pray that you could help us to understand all of these various dimensions of our Lord Jesus Christ and the, their significance for the way we think and the way we understand uh, the significance of the Christian life today and the church today. So, Father, we pray that we might uh, be able to focus on these things as we study this evening. In Christ's name, amen. Okay, we have been studying um, about the person of Christ. And this is extremely important. It's rarely taught anymore, I don't think, outside of a few teaching churches. It, it, it is taught in a somewhat superficial way when it is. And there is so much to this that must be understood. Now, I had one of those days, which I have many times during the year, when I think I'm actually further along in my notes uh, from last time than I was, and so I've been working on a lot of stuff for the, something else, which I won't get to till next week, and then I sat down with the notes from last week, and I realized that I had not finished where I was, so I, we're gonna go over the offices of Christ but we're headed to understanding the historical structure. How did people come to understand what we glibly refer to as the hypostatic union, thinking, oh yeah, that's really simple to understand. Uh, one of the earliest uh, times of conscientiousness of, or consciousness of what the Bible taught about Christ, I was on a bus going to Camp Penile. I was in the ninth grade, and so um, people were talking about, kids were talking about this and that, we were talking about the Bible and some stuff that was being taught at church and whatever, and, and one of the girls there kept saying, you know, there, there's a term Bob always uses, it's something union, something, what is that, what is that, what does that mean? And I had no idea what the missing word was, but later found out it was hypostatic union. And if you use that word in talking about Jesus Christ, you're going to uh, give yourself away as somebody who is an elite student of the Word of God, because most Christians have never even heard the term, much less be able to explain it. 
And so that's really what we've been talking about is the uh, facets of the person of Christ in terms of his deity and his humanity. Now, there's two, or actually, I didn't change the title, but there's three fundamental questions. As I've been studying this last week, I realized that there was a third question that the early church fathers did, were working with as well to answer the first two. The first question, as we've studied, is what was Jesus before he came? Second question is, what was Jesus when he came? And then, in order to clarify the answer to the question two, they focused on, why did Jesus come? Answering that correctly clarifies how you understand the previous two questions, so it's very important. Now, we're not just doing this because we like to have doctrinal Bible studies. We're doing this because we're studying in Philippians 2, 5 through 11, which in context is giving and challenging the Philippian believers that they are supposed to love one another, they're to have a life that is characterized by unity, and to do that they have to live and walk in humility, and that they are to be serving one another. And that is covered in the first four verses. And then the illustration of that, the ultimate illustration, is what does it mean to serve one another, and how does humility relate to that, is the fact that the eternal second person of the Trinity limited himself and entered into human history, taking on the form of a servant. And that is Philippians 2.6. So this whole passage, which talks about what Jesus did at the incarnation, is rich with vocabulary to understand the incarnation and what's going on. But it's not there just to give us facts about the incarnation, but to drive us to understand that if Jesus did this, then that means we're to do it as well to others. And that's challenging. So that's what it means to be Christ-like. So, and the third point was that at his incarnation, God the Son didn't give up any of his divine attributes. He never becomes less than God. If he had given them up, he would be less than God. But he willingly restricts them um, and so that he does not try to solve the problems, temptations, and challenges he faces in his humanity. And the very fact that you have Jesus is God and Jesus is man in the early church, I'm talking about after the apostles but before the third, I mean, fourth century, they can't figure out how to resolve the problem of how could the eternal God be tempted? How could the eternal God face any challenges? And so that's in the backdrop of their struggles. So what we see in the incarnation, verse 5, is that this is the, uh, he, pres he is the highest form of revelation of God to man. His glory is veiled, we know, except for the Mount of uh, Transfiguration, but it is displayed by his works and words. So this is what we've done. I've cleaned up the outline, and first thing we did was we looked at his eternality. That is characteristic of God. All unorthodox and heretical views of Jesus have, have him less than eternal. And if he's less than eternal, he's a creature, not, not God. And a creature cannot die for the other creatures. That is really the end result. That's the answer to that third question is, why did Jesus come? He came to pay the penalty for man's sins. Well, if he came to pay the pe penalty of man's sins, he can't do it if he's a creature, because no creature can do that. And so but once they really got focused on that the answer to that question, then the other aspects became clear. So we looked at passages in the Old Testament, we looked at prophecies, we looked at uh, the passages that indicate that he's eternal and he's God, passages to indicate the Messiah uh, would be man, uh, passages that indicate his humanity and his deity so that all of this comes together in one person. We looked at the prophecies, it's very clear the Old Testament teaches he will be, he's fully God, and the Messiah is fully man. Second, we looked at New Testament passages in the same vein, teaching his deity and his humanity, went through the Gospels and went through the epistles. 
And now what we're looking at is this third section, passages that indicate the offices of Christ. The Messiah has the office of prophet, has the office of priest, and the office of king. And you all can glibly let that roll off the end of your tongue. And that too took a lot of years to get. And frankly, as we look into this, especially understanding the priest part and the king part, we're going to realize that this is ignored by about 99% of Christians today. And they talk about doing stuff for the kingdom. They sing all kinds of shallow little choruses about Jesus is king and Jesus is kingdom. And that denies the basic doctrine of the offices of, the, of Christ. He is prophet, priest, and king. They are not simultaneous. They are, he is always prophet, priest, and king, but he functioned in them successively. So that today he's still functioning as priest, so he's not a king. He's not functioning as king. That comes later. And yet, all these airhead Christians out there today and their airhead pastors don't understand this. It's just so fundamental. I think I've, I've understood the prophet, priest, and king aspect of Jesus for most of my life. And yet, this is, this is what happens. They, they don't even know that. Okay, so we're going to finish up that. And the next week we'll come back and say, how in the world did the early church come to understand this? Because it took them from 100, approximately the death of the last apostle, until 451. So that's three and a half centuries to be able to articulate what you so glibly talk about. It didn't come easily. We only know it because people have worked their way through this before, so we need to understand that. It's also helpful because there's nothing new under the sun, and every one of the heresies about the person of Christ is on the planet today. So it gives you discernment when you hear or read something about Jesus to think accurately about him because you have the, the basic category. So we've seen that in the Old Testament there were prophecies that he was a divine messiah, and also prophecies of a human Messiah, and that they would come together in the one person of the Lord Jesus Christ. So tonight we're looking at what the Bible teaches about the offices of Christ, and that they are evidence of his deity and his humanity. Okay? And so we have to understand those things. So, first point is that Jesus holds <coughs> three offices. The office of offices of prophet, priest, and king. And one of the things that comes up when you look at these three offices is a point I made early is that Jesus holds these offices in his humanity from the time of his incarnation. He's prophet, priest, and king. They are not attributes of him prior to the incarnation. And that, that is what will come out. But he functions as prophet in his, during his incarnation and not as priest until you get to the end. When he is in the Garden of Gethsemane, you have his high priestly prayer, John 17, where he is praying for us, the church, that has not yet come into existence. That is called his high priestly prayer. He is interceding for us at that point. That is a function of a priest. And then what does a priest do? He offers sacrifices to God, and he offers himself as a sacrifice on the cross the next day. And then when he ascends to heaven to the right hand of the Father, he is our intercessor, and he continues. He always lives to make intercession for us, according to Hebrews 7.25, and because he always lives to make intercession for us, he is still functioning as our high priest. That's what most of Hebrews is about. He is a superior high priest to the Levitical priesthood. But when he returns at the second coming, that is when he is referred to as coming as the king. So these are successive in the way they come. All right, so these, func these function successively, not concurrently. 
prophet during the time of the incarnation, priest in his high priestly prayer, and now he's seated at the right hand and king only when he returns. Now, what's an implication of that, that he is now functioning as our high priest and our intercessor? And I can't believe I've gotten this question, and it's a good question because if you hang around with very many Christians, then you'll get, you'll recognize this and you'll get, and you'll, you'll have questions about it. And that is, why is it wrong to pray to Jesus? And I would say, well, it's not wrong, wrong, like you've committed a sin and you pray to Jesus, so you're automatically out of fellowship. It's wrong because you don't understand the procedures and policies. He's a priest. You don't pray to the priest. The priest is the intercessor, is taking your prayers to the Father. You don't pray to the intercessor. You pray to the Father. The Holy Spirit is also our intercessor. And in Romans 8, the Holy, we're told that the Holy Spirit recognizes that we don't know how to pray. So he sort of puts us through the... Holy Spirit translator and shapes up our prayers so that they're ready to present before the Father because we don't know how to pray. So that's very important. But you have a lot of people who are constantly praying to Jesus. And uh, I've had heard some people say, well, you, you, that really doesn't matter. I think it does matter. Uh, every time you have an example of someone other than Jesus praying in the New Testament, they're praying to the Father that Jesus is the intercessor and he is our high priest and you just don't pray to him any more than you'd pray to Mary if you were Catholic and she's an intercessor. You don't pray to an intercessor. That's not the function. Their function is to take your prayer to the Father. That's the role of a priest, just fundamentals. So we'll start with Jesus as prophet. So the role of the prophet is the first po point here, A, that the prophet represents God to the people. The prophet represents God to the people. So the prophet is the spokesman or spokesperson to the people. Now we know that a prophet, that term is used in a rather odd way in a few passages where it refers to Miriam the prophetess, Deborah the prophetess, and you have a group of musicians in uh, First Chronicles that are referred to as those who prophesied with music. So there's a dimension to prophecy that is, uh, that is slightly different. That's how the way the, the word is used. And so um, that helps us to understand something about Huldah and Miriam and Deborah. But the prophet, in terms of its primary role, is represented by God to the people. You have two aspects to a prophet. You have people who are, have the gift of prophecy that God has given them, not a spiritual gift in the Old Testament. You don't have the mention of spiritual gifts until you get to 1 Corinthians. And then you have the mention of uh, that prophecy is a spiritual gift. Ephesians 4.11, God, Christ is given to the church, apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers. So we'll talk about New Testament prophets in, in just a minute. But the Old Testament prophet is, has uh, some distinctive roles that he plays. But he represents God to the people. Under B, the prophet was the means through whom God revealed himself and his message to mankind. So the prophet re it speaks for God to the people, the priest, we'll see, takes the people to the Father. So prophet is God to, represents God to the people. The priest represents the people to God. Fundamental basics. So the prophet is the means through whom God revealed himself and his message to mankind. So we have passages like uh, Exodus 7-1 where there's a comparison. God has just commissioned Moses to go to Pharaoh. And what does Moses say? wait a minute, I stutter, I can't, I'm not really up to the job, I'm not a good public speaker. And so the Lord said to Moses, well, here's the analogy. I'm going to make you like God to Pharaoh, and your brother Aaron shall be your prophet. In other words, Aaron's going to be your spokesperson. 
You're going to be like God. Aaron's going to be like a prophet. And he's going to be the one to speak to God, not you. So you're going to miss out on that opportunity because you just uh, weaseled out of it. Jeremiah 1.9, then the Lord put forth his hand and touched my mouth. The my is referring to Jeremiah. This is in his commissioning by the Lord. And the Lord said to me, behold, I have put my words in your mouth. So when the prophet is functioning as a prophet, he is saying, thus saith the Lord. So you have those who had the, the gift of prophet, like Jeremiah and Isaiah, and you had others uh, that are mentioned uh, throughout, the, throughout the scripture, but, and, but only some had more of an official role as a prophet such as Daniel. I mean, Daniel is an example of one who has the gift of prophecy, but he wasn't a prophet in in Israel representing God to the Jews in Israel. He's not the official prophet like Nathan or Gad were in the court of David. Under C, in the Old Testament, the prophet represents God as the prosecuting attorney from heaven. He is coming to bring a charge against God's people. They're God's people by virtue of a covenant. That that is the Mosaic covenant. That is their uh, national constitution. That is their law code. And that's part of the reason that we come to this principle of that freedom is based on um, being a people of of the law that we recognize that w- the principle of the rule of law and that that is absolute. It doesn't matter how you feel about it. It doesn't matter that it's a bad law in, in, in some sense. It may not be written well, but we have to obey it until we change it because within the Constitution, there are ways to legally change something that the people don't like. But we have a country today that is antinomian. That means they're against law. And so it doesn't matter if we don't like it. We're just not going to do it. We're just going to disobey it. We're going to act like it's not there. And we have people in, uh, in courtrooms, judges in courtrooms. We have jurors in courtrooms. We have legislators in uh, state congresses and the federal congress who really don't care what the law says. That's antinomianism. And so when the people of any, any political entity, or so, when someone breaks the law, it's the, defend, it's the prosecuting attorney it is the, that comes and brings a charge against them. And that's what the prophets were. They were the legal representa- representative of God bringing a charge against the nation because they have violated uh, the law of, of the covenant. So that's, that's their primary role. And there's a word in Hebrew uh, that relates to this. It's a term reeve, which has to do with a, a courtroom, bringing a courtroom case. Uh, Dr. Chafer, in his Systematic Theology in volume three, uh, volume, or volume three, page 18, and several of these quotes in here come out of uh, Chafer, that, that area, he's got a very good discussion of this. He says, the Old Testament prophet was appointed of God to give warnings about the chastisement of God that was impending upon his erring people and with the predictions to give the witness from Jehovah that the purpose and faithfulness of Jehovah with respect to Israel's ultimate blessings could never fail. So there's always a message of hope. God's going to punish you. God's going to bring these promised judgments upon you, but God is not going to go back on his promise to give you the land and make you, uh, make you a great nation. So the prophet was a prosecuting attorney representing God and bringing condemnation upon the people. Now, there were some Old Testament prophets uh, before, and before the call of Abraham. For example, Matthew 23, 34, and 35, Jesus is in the midst of bringing his, he's functioning as a prophet here, and he is bringing his indictment against the Pharisees. And there there are, what, seven, maybe eight woes, depending on the textual variant there, 
that Jesus charges the Pharisees with. So he's functioning as a prophet there, and he bring, ends up with the condemnation of Jerusalem, and he says, therefore, indeed, I send you prophets, wise men and scribes, some of them you will kill and crucify, and some of them you will scourge in your synagogues and persecute from city to city, that on earth you may come, uh, come all, th that on you may come all the righteous blood shed on the earth, from the blood of righteous Abel to the blood of Zechariah. So he seems to be including Abel as a prophet in that passage, and there were other prophets prior to. Uh, Abraham. Uh, under E, the greatest of all the Old Testament prophets was John the Baptist. John, Jesus himself said that, that he was the greatest of all of the, uh, greatest of all of the prophets. And he sought to restore the nation and their relationship to God so that they would be able to realize the covenant blessings of uh, of the Mosaic law. That's why he was saying, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. If they would turn back to God and turn away from the idolatry of legalism, the idolatry of, of, uh, uh, of the pagan, pagan worldview, then God would then bring the kingdom because the king was coming to offer the kingdom. So, He's the last prophet of the old order and herald of the Messiah. That's a quote from Chafer. So Matthew eleven nine. 9, but what did you go out to see? Jesus says to the crowds, a prophet? Yes, I say to you, and more than a prophet. In John 1, 29, the next day after Jesus had first appeared before John the Baptist, John saw Jesus coming toward him and announced to the people, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. So he's functioning in the role of a, of a prophet. And so uh, he, Jesus said, nothing, no one was, no Old Testament prophet was greater. John the Baptist was, was the greatest. Under F, frequently, in the course of their announcement of judgment on the nation, the prophet would describe future events. See, most people think that a prophet is just somebody who tells you about the future. That's not right. A prophet is someone who brings a charge of condemnation against the nation. In the context of that, he's going to talk about what's going to happen in the future. And so he is going to give information about uh, about the future. Now Daniel is, is different because Daniel is not a national prophet in that sense, but he, so, but he has the gift of prophecy, so he is foretelling, but he is also announcing judgment on Gentile nations in most of those passages. So that's, that's a context there. The, um, in the New Testament, that's point G, there are New Testament prophets. It was a temporary gift, just like the gifts of healing, gifts of tongues, gifts of prophets were all uh, temporary gifts. And they functioned in both roles. That is the role of, of foretelling. See, what happens is that you often get people who are in church today. I've heard people use this breakdown. I've heard really good people use this breakdown. It always irritates me. And tries to say, okay, a prophet did two things. There was foretelling and foretelling. Well, that, that sounds good, and there's a little alliteration there, but it's not real clear. And it's used in a very bad way because what you get from a lot of people in certain denominations is that they will say, well, see, in the, well, the New Testament prophets weren't doing any foretelling. They were only doing foretelling. And then there are those among that group who apply that and say, we still have that going on today. Or, or, wait a minute, I got that backwards, excuse me. They're, they're not doing any foretelling, but they're doing forthtelling. And they call that preaching. And so preaching is the gift of prophecy today. 
that's just bad hermeneutics and bad exegesis. And it leads to a lot of bad practices in the church. So even, you, you take a category that, that is somewhat dubious and then you try to use it in these other ways. It just doesn't work. Uh, 1 Corinthians 14.3, Paul says, But he who prophesies speaks edification and exhortation and comfort to men. So that's, that's the focus. It was in a time when the New Testament uh, canon of Scripture was not yet complete. And so it was necessary in places to go to these who had the New Testament gift of prophecy to understand certain things. And I believe you have certain men like Mark, who wrote the Gospel of Mark, who was not an apostle. You have Luke, who was not an apostle. He was the companion of the Apostle Paul. And we don't know who wrote Hebrews. But we have these other writers of the New Testament who were not apostles, but I believe they were prophets. They were New Testament prophets. And uh, prophets and apostles were given to equip the church. So that would make, uh, make a great deal of sense. Now we're going to turn, let's, let's look at these passages. I want you to turn to Deuteronomy chapter 13. Deuteronomy chapter 13. Under this point, which is point H, there are two ways that an Old Testament prophet was to be tested. Because they would validate themselves as a prophet in their foretelling of future events. Now, these might be near future events, not in times events, because nobody's going to live that long. But they would also give evidence of, of uh, some things that would happen in the near uh, in the near future, and that would validate their claim to be a prophet. So Deuteronomy 13, 1 through 3. Now this is really important. It's amazing how people kind of miss this. And I remember the first time, I think I was hear, hear, hearing Charlie Clough go through this. I was probably, I wasn't in seminary yet or, or just barely there. And he, he was going through this and he says, pay attention to the first verse. There arises among you a prophet. So this is somebody who says that they're a prophet. He's a dreamer of dreams, or he gives you a sign or a wonder. Notice there's no word there for a false sign or false wonder. They truly heal somebody. They, they truly perform something miraculous. Because the writing here doesn't question the actual a miraculous event. Someone who gives you a sign or a wonder and the sign or wonder comes to pass. Oh, this person must be speaking for God. They predicted exactly what would happen. What does is, what is Moses say? And then this person speaks. Now what's important is what they teach, not what they did. And everybody wants to go, oh, look, look at that miracle. Oh, they said an angel appeared to them, and they just all get sucked into the whole thing. But the point is, what does the Bible teach? What's the content of Scripture? That's the criteria, is what they're teaching consistent with what is taught in the Scripture? Or does it contradict Scripture? So he says, the sign of wonder comes to pass, of which he spoke, uh, saying, let us go after other gods. Oh, this is what he teaches. He's performed a miracle, but what he has told them to do is to violate the first commandment, which is, you shall have no other gods before me. So God has told them, you can't worship any other gods, and this person who performed what looked like a miracle, or who healed somebody, or he had some kind of dream or vision that came true, and then he says, well, let's go worship Baal. Let's go worship the Asherah. Let's go have a good time with the pagan gods. And God says, that's how you know. You, he's, you know he's a false prophet by what he says, not by the fact that he could perform some kind of a miracle. And so the, what the command is in verse 3, you shall not listen to the words of that prophet or that dreamer of dreams. For the Lord your God is testing you 
So you go to some church and some faith healer comes out and he says, oh, you've got cancer and it tells you 15 things about it, which you just heard from the doctor yesterday. And you go, this guy's got to be from God. I've heard people do that. I heard a Dallas seminary graduate that I went to seminary with who got sucked into that. I mean, anybody can get it. So don't, don't think, well, I'm too smart for that. And so he sa- what, God, what uh, Moses says is, you shall not listen to the words of that prophet or that dreamer of dreams, for the Lord your God is testing you to see if you're going to put your authority in the word of God or in experience. Are you going to put it in the word of God or in experience? And see, the principle is that we do one of two things. We either judge the Word of God by our own limited reason or experience, which is what Satan tempted Eve to do in the garden. He said, did God really say this? You won't die. And so Eve's put in a position to determine whether what God said was true or false. And she can only rely on her own experience or her own limited uh, reason. Okay, so... And I'm saying limited reason because as a creature, we all have limited reason. So, so what Moses says is don't listen to the words of the prophet for the Lord your God's testing you to know if you will love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. God wants to know, are you going to put his word above your experience? So we have to judge our experience by the word of God not judge the Word of God or interpret the Word of God on the basis of our experience. Now the passage goes on, verse 4 says, You shall walk after the Lord your God and fear Him and keep His commandments and obey His voice. You shall serve Him and hold fast to Him, not follow after false prophets. But that prophet or that dreamer of dreams shall be put to death. Wow, that's just so harsh. God's for capital punishment. Well, we can't believe in a God like that. Well, th- you got to have a little broader sense of what it's all about. Is the reason is that, that lies lead to destruction. And so what God is saying is that a liar on that, of that magnitude is such a danger to society, such a danger to culture, such a danger to my people, that he has to be surgically removed from the earth. He's, he has uh, sacrificed his right to life. And it um, goes on to say, because he has spoken in order to turn you away from the Lord your God. That's serious. See, we don't take that seriously in our world today. Somebody who tries to turn you away from God is worthy of the death penalty. That's how important our relationship with God is. Because he has spoken in order to turn you away from the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt and redeemed you from the house of bondage to entice you from the way in which the Lord your God commanded you to walk. So you shall put away, you shall put away the evil from your midst. So there's a good definition of evil. Evil is somebody who leads you into disobedience to God, which is a form of idolatry. Then we have a second passage, very important, Deuteronomy 18, 15. The Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from your midst. So Moses is talking, and he's telling something about the future. In the future, God is going to raise up a prophet, not just any prophet. This is a messianic prophecy. It is the prophet. He will raise up for you a prophet like me from your midst, from your brethren. Him you shall hear according to all you desired of the Lord your God in Horeb. That's another name for Mount Sinai where they received the law. Remember at Mount Sinai when God gave the law, the people all bowed down and said, we will serve the Lord, we will serve the Lord. And and then the next couple of days they're having an orgy. Verse 17, and the Lord said to me, what they have spoken is good. So they even heard the voice of the Lord. They said, they said Moses, you go up there and get the rest of it. We can't, we can't make it if we keep hearing the voice of God because it's too convicting. Um, so they said, Don't let, let, let's not hear the voice of the Lord, my God, again. 
And so the Lord said uh, to uh, Moses, said what they've done is spoken is good. I will raise up for them a prophet like you from among their brethren and will put my words in his mouth and he shall speak to them all that I command him. This is a messianic prophecy of Jesus' role as a prophet. And we'll come back to that. And then Moses goes on to say, and it shall be that whoever will not hear, or God goes on speaking in verse 19, and it shall be that whoever will not hear my words, which he speaks in my name, I will require it of him. Okay, so if you don't obey the prophet, especially the prophet which in the future, then God is going to hold you accountable for that. But the prophet who presumes to speak a word in my name, a prophet who says, thus saith the Lord, and God didn't say it, who, uh, which I have not commanded him to speak, or who speaks in the name of other gods, that prophet shall die. Death penalty again. And if you say in your heart, how shall you, we know the word which the Lord has spoken? Why would they ask that question? Because every Tom, Dick, and Harry is coming along and says, well, God told me to do this, and I prayed about it last night, and God spoke to me in my sleep, and this is what he wants me to do. And so you have everybody around in Christianity going, God's, God told me to do this. God told me to do that. Well, how do you know it was God? God told me not to do that. How do you know that? Oh, I had the stomachache last night. Well, it's just bad food. So when a prophet speaks in the name of the Lord, if the thing does not happen or come to pass, that is the thing which the Lord has not spoken. Because God requires 100% accuracy in prediction, not 99.9. So if he has said something and it doesn't come to pass, then the prophet has spoken it presumptuously. You shall not be afraid of him. The death penalty, if one little mistake, one little part doesn't come to pass, then the whole thing is to be ignored and false. Jesus fulfilled this role in several ways in the New Testament. The multitudes in Matthew 21, 11 said, this is Jesus, the prophet from Nazareth. Later in Matthew 21, 46, when they sought to lay hands on him, they feared the multitudes because they took him for a prophet. So verse 11, the prophets say he's, a, I mean, the multitudes say he's the prophet from Nazareth, but the Jewish leaders didn't recognize that. In Luke 7, 16, fear came upon all the people and said, a great prophet has risen among us and God has visited his people. So there were many people who recognized Jesus was this prophet Moses had predicted, Luke 24, 19. And he said to them, what things? So they said to him, the things concerning Jesus of Nazareth, who was a prophet mighty in deed and word before God and all the people. So there were those who recognized him and that he was the fulfillment of that prophecy about the coming prophet in Deuteronomy 18. And Deuteronomy 6, 14, Then those men, when they had seen the sign that Jesus did, said, This is truly the prophet who is to come into the world. There were many who recognized he was the fulfillment of the Deuteronomy uh, 18 passage that God would send a prophet like Moses So Jesus is a prophet, and he fulfilled that many ways by the way he spoke to the people. He fulfilled that in his discourses when he spoke. For example, in the Sermon on the Mount, he was interpreting the law of Moses to the people in contrast to the teaching of the Pharisees. So he is condemning them in the process of properly explaining the Word of God. In Matthew chapter 23, he is, brings a great charge and condemnation against uh, the Pharisees because of their hypocrisy. And then in Matthew 24 and 25, he uh, predicts the future judgment on Israel that will come during the tribulation. So all of these indicate Jesus functioned as a prophet. And he revealed God. No man has seen God at any time, but the only begotten has revealed him to us. So then he's a priest. The role of the priest is to represent the people to God. The prophet represented God to the people. The priest represents the people to God. 
And so this is his second, um, his second office. And it began to function, it began to function at the end of that night before he went to the cross. He's in the upper room. He's giving a prediction about what will happen in the coming church age. And then he prays in John 17 for the church. And then he's arrested at Gethsemane. And then he is taken to the cross where he is offered as he offers himself as a sacrifice for our sins. That's the function of a priest. So he has high priestly prayer. Now this is covered in detail in Hebrews. So a lot of these verses that I'm getting ready to show you are all from uh, Hebrews. He's a priest, Hebrews says, not after the order of Aaron. He's not a Levitical priest. He's not an Aaronic high priest. He is after the order of Melchizedek. Now who was Melchizedek? Melchizedek was the priest king of Jerusalem when um, Abraham rescued Lot and the others who had been taken captive from, from Sodom and Gomorrah by the uh, eastern kings. And so he, Abraham comes back to Jerusalem, recognizes Melchizedek as a true uh, priest of El Elyon, the Most High God, and offers him uh, a tithe and everybody misses this part everybody wants to go preach tithing he offered him a tithe of the spoils he didn't offer him a tithe of his what he had he offered a tithe of of the spoils and what were the spoils the spoils were all the stuff that was stolen by those kings from the people who lived in Sodom and Gomorrah in the cities of the plains. So first of all, this, these, these kings comes through and they go down the Jordan Valley and they destroy all of these uh, towns and they take the people captive to make them slaves and they've got all of this plunder. And then Abraham attacks them with his army of his, of his uh, servants and they capture the kings and they take the, all of the plunder, which they're going to restore 90% of it to the people, but they're going to give 10% of it to the priest of God. He's not tithing like somebody in church. That, that is the silliest thing I ever heard of. Nobody reads the text. So he is a priest after the order of Melchizedek. Melchizedek was a priest king. Melchizedek was a Gentile. Jews are going to come from Abraham's descendants, Melchizedek is already older than, than, uh, than Abraham. Hebrews 5, 6, and he also says in another place, you are a priest, speaking of Jesus in Psalm 110, when uh, my Lord said to my Lord, take, seat, take a seat at my right hand. Then two verses later, he says, you are a priest forever, the order of Melchizedek. So his priesthood officially begins when he takes his seat at the right hand of the Father in what is known as the session. And so that is quoted in Hebrews 5.6 and in Hebrews 5.10, he's called by God as high priest according to the order of Melchizedek. See, the nature of his priesthood was also sinless according to Hebrews 4.15. So he has a sinless priesthood. Hebrews 4.15, for we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but was in all points tempted as we are, yet without sin. Now, that was a major problem in the early church. They couldn't figure out how, how the God-man could be tempted if he's God. So it's, it, it, we'll get to that next, next time, but that's just sort of foreshadowing. His priest is, is also eternal. Now, it had a beginning, but it doesn't have an end. Because all of these began with the incarnation. So Jesus, second person of the Trinity, isn't a priest. He's not a prophet, priest, or king in his deity prior to the incarnation. So it also has a beginning in time, but it goes on forever. Therefore, he is also able to save to the uttermost those who come to God through him, 
since he always lives to make intercession for them. Hebrews 7.25 E, we learn that his priesthood began at the cross. Actually, the prayer before is that way, but I'm slicing the bologna kind of thin there. According to Hebrews 9.14 and 12.24, his very death was a priestly sacrifice. Hebrews 9.14, how much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, cleanse your conscience from dead works to serve the living God? F, he is not transferable to anybody else. He's not going to have descendants who are going to be priests. And uh, Hebrews 7.15, and it is far more evident if in the likeness of Melchizedek there arises another priest who has come not according to the law of fleshly commandment, which has to do with the inheritance rights of, from Aaron, but according to the power of an endless life. So since he lives forever, he de there doesn't need to be a successor. He is a priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek. Gee, his priesthood is not changeable. It's a unique priesthood according to Hebrews 7.24. But he, because he continues forever, has an unchangeable, an immutable priesthood. So you think about these verses, what they are telling us about who Jesus is for us right now in terms of being our high priest day in and day out, making intercession for us. He is constantly there as our advocate so when Satan brings charges against you, Jesus is always there and says, that's covered by my death, taken care of. Again and again and again. He must get tired of that for some of us. Really tired of it for the rest of us. So H, Jesus clearly qualified for his office according to Hebrews 1.3. He was the brightness or the effulgence, the expression of God's glory and the express image, that the imprint of God's person, the divine person, and upholding all things by the word of his power. That's why environmentalism is wrong. Because Jesus is upholding all things by the word of his power. Not because you're going to get an electric vehicle. Not because you separate your garbage at the curb. None of that stuff is going to do anything for the planet. One volcano in one day can put up more nasty chemicals into the universe than mankind will put up in the entire history of the human race. And for people to think that, I loved a meme I saw the other day uh, and it, it, it um, I, I can't remember it right now, but it was, it was about, um, let me see. Um, oh, I lost it. All right, I. He was appointed by the, he was appointed to the office by God in Hebrews 5, 5 through 8. So also Christ did not glorify himself to become high priest, but it was he who said to him, you are my son, Today I have begotten you. I remember what that meme was. The meme was that, that for, for the government, you look at all the governments of the world, and they can't solve the problem of homelessness. But they can change the earth's temperature if they just tax you a little more. Arrogance of man. Okay, so Christ did not glorify himself to become high priest. But it was he who said to him, you are my son, today I have begotten you. That's Psalm 110, 1. Uh, no, excuse me, you are my son, today I have begotten you. That's Psalm 2. Uh, Hebrews 5, 6. And he also says in another place, you are a priest forever, according to the order of Melchizedek. That's Psalm 110, 1, and 1 through 3. Uh, so Hebrews 5, 7, who in the days of his flesh, when he had offered up prayers and supplications with vehement cries, and tears to him who was able to save him from death and was heard because of his godly fear. And verse 8, though he was a son, yet he learned obedience by the things that he suffered. So God appoints him to the office of priest, our high priest. J, his priesthood is efficacious. 
It accomplishes that which it attempts to do in Hebrews 10.4, for it is not possible that the blood of bulls and goats could take away sins, but Christ's death did. Under K, it continues even after his ascension according to these verses, Hebrews 4.14, we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens. Hebrews 6.20, he's a high priest forever. And he, verse, uh, Hebrews 8.1 he is seated at the right hand of the throne of the majesty in the heavens. And the last one, this is the 11th point. It is an exalted priesthood in Hebrews 9.24. So he has not entered the holy places made with hands, which are copies of the true, but into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God. What are those last two words? For us. He's our priest. He is not our king. He is our high priest. But what does it matter? Scripture's just vague. So Jesus also completes the work of a high priest as both sacrifice and sacrificer. Hebrews 9, 11, just the whole of the ninth chapter. Christ came as high priest of the good things to come with the greater and more perfect tabernacle not made with hands, that is not of this creation, not with the blood of goats and calves, but with his own blood. He entered the most holy place. He, is, he offers himself as a sacrifice because the blood of bulls and goats can't take away sin. But how much more the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, cleanse your conscience from dead works to serve the living God, and he is the mediator then of the new covenant. That goes on through the end. In Hebrews 10, 12, we read, but this man, after he had offered one sacrifice of sins forever, sat down at the right hand of God. From that time, waiting, Jesus is our intercessor, and he's waiting for something. What's he waiting for? He's waiting for God to give him the nod that's in Daniel 7. And then as the son of man, he's going to come and ask for the kingdoms of the earth. And that's what starts Revelation chapter 4. So he's waiting to that time. So this, this, this operation footstool does not begin until Jesus is given that scroll in Revelation 5. From that time, waiting till his enemies are made his footstool, for by one offering he has perfected forever those who are being sacrificed. We are, protect, per, we are perfected forever. 1 Corinthians 5, 7, Therefore purge out the old leaven that you may be a new lump, since you truly are unleavened. We're not becoming unleavened. We are unleavened, even with your nasty little sin nature. For indeed, Christ, our Passover, was sacrificed for us. And that brings us to the third office. The third office is that of king. Genesis 49.10 predicts this, that there will be a king that will come from Judah. The scepter shall not depart from Judah. Now, a scepter is like a, a very... Uh, complicated, beautifully carved uh, symbol of one's position of rulership and royalty. And so the king holds this scepter. It looks like a cane, but it's not. It is a sign of rulership. The scepter shall not d depart from Judah, nor a lawgiver from between his feet until Shiloh comes. Now, that's a really poor translation and I'm not going to go through the details. You've got to go look at this word as it's used in, uh, in, in Jeremiah. But it should be correctly translated until he whose right it is comes. Because that's how it's actually translated in the context of Jeremiah. Until he whose right it is comes. And to him shall be the obedience of the people. So there's a prediction that he's going to come from the tribe of Judah. We know the, they, that the Old Testament predicts he comes from Adam, because we all come from Adam, comes from Noah, we all come from Noah, then it's narrowed down to Abraham, 
and then it's through Isaac and Jacob and then Judah that is the line of the rulership, the seed of the woman. Numbers 24, 17, in a prophecy of that strange little creature, Balaam, I see him, talking about the future Messiah, the future ruler, I see him, but not now. I behold him, but not near. A star shall come out of Jacob. Okay, so this star is the star that the, um, that the Magi saw. This is the prediction of it. A star shall come out of Jacob, referring to Christ. We refer to celebrities as stars. They're sports stars. They're theatrical stars. They're uh, movie stars. They, uh, so we refer to them. So this is uh, this, uh, a mark of someone who is known and someone who is a celebrity. A star shall come out of Jacob. A scepter, this, the one who is a ruler, uh, shall rise out of Israel. And what will he do? He will batter the brow of Moab and destroy all the sons of Tumult. So Moab is a distant cousin through Lot. And this, there are other prophecies in the minor prophets to the destruction of Moab at the time of, of the battle, the campaign of Armageddon. So he's going to be the king. Now we go to Psalm 110, 1 and 2. The Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand till I make your enemies your footstool. Then speaking to my, the, the, then the Lord uh, shall send the rod of your strength. Your strength is referring to the my Lord, the Messiah. The Lord the Father shall send the rod of your strength, the Messiah, out of Zion. Rule in the midst of your enemies. This is what will happen when Jesus comes. So uh, when he came at the first coming, he was announced as being the king. He was offering himself as the king. He wasn't crowned king yet. He offered himself as the king of Israel. And so this was recognized. Matthew 2.2, 2, the Magi came, and they said, where is he who is born king of the Jews? And that scared Herod tremendously because he was the king, but they weren't talking about him. And he was always paranoid about someone taking the throne from him. And then in Matthew 21, 4 and 5, as Jesus enters into Jerusalem riding on the foal of a donkey, uh, there's a prophecy fulfilled from Zechariah uh, that the king is coming to you lowly and sitting on a donkey. In Luke 1:32, uh, the angel Gabriel announces to Mary that her son will be great and he will be called the son of the highest and the Lord God will give him the throne of his father David. He will be a descendant and heir of King David. Uh, Luke one thirty three, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and his, of his kingdom there will be no end. Uh, that's not happening yet. He's not ruling over the house of Jacob yet. He's not the messianic king yet. Uh, in John one forty nine, Jesus has uh, uh, just told Daniel what he's been reading and what he's been thinking, and Daniel answers him and says, Rabbi, you are the son of God. You are the king of Israel. And uh, John uh, eighteen thirty seven, Pilate said to him, Are you really a king? That's what he's asking. Are you a king then? And Jesus answered, You say rightly that I am a king. So he admitted this. I am a king. For this cause I was born, and for this cause I have come into the world that I should bear witness to the truth. Everyone who is of the truth hears my voice. B, second, but the king was rejected. The Jewish people rejected Jesus as the king, and the kingdom was postponed. And it's not, till, it's not going to come until Jesus returns, and the people say, uh, welcome him, and call upon him to come and save them. So, uh, but at his crucifixion, there's a sign put up there that is uh, the king of the Jews. The king of the Jews. And so often in art, you will see a portrayal of the cross. And over the cross, you will see four letters, I-N-R-I. -I. 
the first I, which is the beginning of the Greek word Jesus, okay, is for Jesus. Jesus. Jesus of Nazareth, that's the N. The next letter is R for the Latin word rex. Latin and Greek both have Jesus. So Jesus, um, Jesus of Nazareth, rex Judea, king of the Jews. That's what that means. It's proclaimed all the time in all kinds of art. John 19, 21, therefore the chief priests of the Jews said to Pilate, do not write the king of the Jews, but he said, I am the king of the Jews. And Pilate said, what I've written, I have written. Then see, Jesus is coming again, however, and he is destined to return. And at that time, he sets up his kingdom and rule over Israel. Uh, Matthew 25, 34 says, Then the king will say to those on his right hand, Come, you blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared to you, for you from the foundation of the world. And these will go away into everlasting punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. That's at the end of the, of the, sep, of the sheep, description of the sheep and the goat judgment. Matt, Revelation 19, 15. As Jesus returns at the second coming to end the campaign of Armageddon. Now out of his mouth, go, he comes down on a white horse, and the, John describes it, out of his mouth goes a sharp sword, that with it he should strike the nations, and he himself will rule them with a rod of iron. Where, where do we find that rod of iron? Psalm 110.2. I just read it to you. Psalm 2. He will rule them with a rod of iron. He himself treads the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God. And he has on his robe and on his thigh a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And that's not till the second coming. But we have to end the church age first, and we have to look forward to the rapture, Maranatha, even so. Come, Lord Jesus. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this opportunity to study these things and to come to a greater understanding of who our Lord is and all of his magnificence and that he is and will be the ruler of all nations and he will be the ruler over all of the kingdoms of the earth and when he returns, every knee shall bow and every tongue confess Jesus Christ is Lord. And so, Father, we look forward to that time and we look forward to his return for us in the clouds that we might go to be with him forever and to get out of this awful mess. But Father, until then, we must live for you. We must shine forth his lights in the midst of this cesspool on the earth. And we pray that you would just give us the uh, fortitude and perseverance and strength and the understanding of your word to be able to be faithful. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen.